the what <laughs> I, I asked myself last week, well, actually a couple days ago, I wonder if they know why I chose this book. Why this is the book that I chose to study first. So a little background about me. I, uh, I think a couple months ago, I kind of mentioned my church background. And this was, book, sorry about that. this was the book that led me out of legalism. I was entrenched in legalism. I was, and this is, this study is not to, um, for me personally, is not an attack towards those who taught me before. Absolutely not. But this is the book that led me to understanding that without Christ, I am nothing. And it is in Him, it is by faith in Him alone, that I am saved, I am justified. I cannot do anything to earn my place with God or keep my place with God. It's all Jesus. All I, ha all I can do is accept it. But before I believed that, I'll tell you what, my life was full of anxiety as a Christian. My life was full of fear. My life was full of getting up worried about whether or not I'm going to lose my salvation. I was scared to death every day. And it was interesting, not from this book, but when I read the parable of the prodigal son, really for the first time a couple years, I'd say a couple years ago, it blew my mind how I didn't understand at least how I see it now, that parable, that God is presented as a father. Jesus presents God as a father, not some rigid, legalistic God who's going to smash you the moment you do something wrong or the moment you, I mean, if you have certain problems in your life. He's not going to smash you. He loves you. It took me a long time to really accept that because at that time, I was instead taking in what I was being taught. Granted, the teachers who taught me, very sincere people. They love the Lord, I have no doubt. But it was a false teaching, what they were teaching me. And I say that with all love and humility and respect. Uh, so this is why I believe that this book was uh, the first book that I chose for us to study on. Because I interact with Christians, and um, there is unfortunately a bis big misunderstanding today of how a person gets right with God, how a person stays right with God, and um, specifically within Christian circles. Um, I came from the Churches of Christ. Churches of Christ are very big, very big on works, which works have their place, amen. But they, they use them as a qualification, getting right with God, just like many other religions, Islam, all sorts of stuff. Um, but Are they the non-instrumental? That's the one we come from. Okay. And that... Um, <laughs> That's an interesting story in and of itself right there. And my wife and I, we met at a church that was non-instrumental. And uh, when I came in, this is back in 2012, when I came in, uh, first became Christian, she was going out. <laughs> I was coming in, she was going out. Because I believe it was this issue, or maybe a, many other issues, but I was like Moses on top of the mountain preaching that instruments was wrong, sinful, anyone who uses them. Going to hell. I never said it that way, but that's what I believe. You mean musical instruments? Musical instruments. Boom, boom. Yes. Musical instruments. If you had it, you're wrong. And you may not even be a Christian. That is where I was at. And I met her. I mean, I fell for... The philosophy behind that. Why are they... So the philosophy behind this is that they use a certain lens how they interpret Scripture. It's called... It's, called, it's abbreviated as a C-E-N-I which stands for Command, Example, and Necessary Inference. So when you come to the Scriptures, if you do not have a command from the Apostles, an example, or a necessary inference to do something in your church gatherings, it's therefore prohibited. That's what they, that's what they believe. And they, that traces back to the uh, Restoration Movement by Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell in the 19th century. And what they did was... Pretty much, if, if you do not see the apostles doing something, it's wrong. Well, that is the most inconsistent application I've ever seen by a church. Because even churches of Christ, other churches, I mean, you do many things in your church gathering of which, or, and have many things in your church gatherings, like electronics, PowerPoint presentations, you name it, pitch, pipes, pews, bathrooms, parking lots, you want to go on and on, we can, that you do not find in the scriptures. So they say... That because of that, that it is wrong. It is sinful. You cannot do it. And that's what I used to teach. I used to hold strong to that. 
And then I, I met Laura, and I mean, I fell she's for her. Jeff. Yeah, she's straight. Uh, well, we, we started, we started, yeah, yeah, I know. We started dating, and this was a big issue for me. She started, started to attend a church that had musical instruments, the one that we previously just came from. I was not okay with that. So I had secret motives. But I, 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 yes, I, 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 it was my goal to convert her over back to this belief because in my mind, in my mind, she got off track. She strayed away from the faith. She strayed away. cared enough to think you could change her. That's right, yeah. So, uh, we started talking and she was very firm on what she believed. Her family is too. And, um... Long story short, I was the one that changed, um, and it was not because of my love for her. It was because of my genuine, serious study of the scriptures. That is where that is why I changed. It took years. To get it there. took it took years for me to unwind what I was taught, emotional emotional turmoil. Because my family is comes from this church, comes from these backgrounds, comes from these beliefs, and I'm kind of shunned in a way in is some your circles. Still there? My mother's still there. Yes, but she. Um, she doesn't, I don't. She has the same mindset. Uh, no, 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 no. She don't. She does not have the same mindset. However, um, she's more tolerant of it. And That comes with age. <laughs> well, I, I, as much as I've studied scripture, I look at doctrines such as that. When you exclude we are excluded from many churches of Christ. When I talk about churches of Christ, I'm not painting with a broad brush. Churches of Christ that we just came from, we just came from Church of Christ. They, they'd accept us as brothers and sisters. It's diff- you got different divisions in different groups. But the one that we came from before, the previous one in, Hager- the one in Hagerstown, we're not Christians because we have these. And it doesn't just stop at instruments. There's many other pet doctrines, and I call them pet doctrines because... They're secondary issues. They're not even, they have nothing to do with how a person's saved. If, in fact, none of the apostles even talk about these doctrines that they divide over. Um, and it's not just churches of Christ, you know, Jehovah's, uh, every sort, different other group. Uh, but um, this was a serious issue, and after studying very hard on this and praying very hard, um, here I am today. <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, this, this book, I believe, is even though there, this was for a specific purpose, Galatians, concerning the Mosaic Law, as we'll see, and people wanting to add the requirement of circumcision to getting right with God and keeping the Mosaic Law, you know, the Word of God is active and we apply it to our life today. There may not be a person trying to say you have to be circumcised to be saved, but they'll say, you can't have instruments, well, you can't be saved, or you got to do this to be saved, you got to do that to be saved. It's not, and you're completely getting away from Jesus and what he did. When you do that, you are completely forgetting that Jesus said it is finished. Mm-hmm. He had to come and fill the requirement. I'm, I'm giving some thunder away. So, uh, And as we continue to study through this, I, I hope and pray that it's clear to everybody that um, how a person is made right with God and how they stay right with God is by faith in Jesus Christ. And this is in no way, no way, no way promoting sin at all because many times many people think that if you teach you're saved by faith alone in christ by grace alone and faith alone in christ that you're saying oh well you can just sin do it no absolutely not grace does not give you liberty to sin grace does not give you a license to sin paul is crystal clear on that in fact titus 2 says grace teaches you not to sin to deny ungodliness um anyways i'm kind of getting off track but uh that is why I chose this, because of my gra- background personally, and uh, I felt that it would be really beneficial to everybody. Um, and uh, So, uh, does anyone want to, the study guides that you have, want to read the first part of where I have the background? This is just kind of a summary that I took from the Schofield Study Bible of what this book is all about. It kind of said it better than I could. Um, does anyone want to read? If not, that's okay. I'll read it. I'll go ahead. I'm a teacher. You're a teacher, that's right. (laughs) Galatia was located in the center of what is now known as Asia Minor. The original inhabitants were, I shouldn't have 
<laughs> yeah. Hungarians? Yeah, there's some hard words in there. Yeah. With a religion of worship. Many Jews who lived in this city. Churches were facing Looks a, little a double warm. threat involving purity of doctrine and purity of conduct. Certain individuals would come to the area who would distort the gospel of Christ. They insisted that while salvation was of Christ, works were also necessary for salvation. The Galatians were already beginning to yield to this Judaizing, that is, legalistic error, thus returning to a bondage of observing days, months, years, times, etc. Paul overwhelmingly destroys all arguments in favor of mixing law with faith by pointing out that Abraham was justified by faith alone 430 years before the giving of the Mosaic Law. Okay. I think there was a technical error on that paragraph. I said something wrong? No, not you. No, no, no. How, how I printed it off. This is an operator error. <laughs> so, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's probably me too, because I do these things really quick sometimes too. Okay, so... Uh, I want I I wanted to read chapter one uh, of Galatians, and if you don't have a Bible, that's okay. Uh, I'll be reading from the New King James. Uh, I don't know, so if you have an NIV and a King James, my it might back and forth, back and forth. Uh, so if if anyone wants to, do you just want me to read it, or we can just bounce around? Doesn't matter. Okay, I'll go ahead and read chapter one. Um, so here we go. Paul, an apostle. Not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel... I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches... Any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son to me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ. But they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. So that's chapter one. There's a lot we can unpack in that. Uh, and I had, and I broke it down into six questions for the sake of time. I could have went on and on and on. Because there's a lot in this book that, again, this is the book that really changed my direction with Christ. It really did. It really, it really changed it. Um, so this study guide I have, uh, 
So I have some in the back. If if you don't have one, if you don't want to use one, that's completely fine. I got uh, these questions that got us through. So question number one. Paul begins his letter to the Galatian churches by stating that he is, quote, an apostle, not of man, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Why do you think he felt the need to explain that he was an apostle through Jesus Christ and God the Father rather than from men? Anyone got anything on that? Why do you think that Paul needed to explain that he was an apostle through Jesus Christ and God the Father rather than from men? I think that as Christians, we may be um, taught... And we may learn from earthly people, mm -hmm. but I think if there comes a time that you experience Christ, and there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. And you find that out as soon as it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely. I Agreed. think also, uh, Paul had a reputation you mm -hmm. know, where he was doing what men wanted him to be doing. Mm -hmm. He was mm -hmm. a church leader. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think he wanted these people to know I'm a changed man. Mm -hmm. I've seen the light like Gary Johnson saw the light. That's right. <laughs> Amen. I got on here. Uh, he wanted to assure his readers that he's the real deal. He's not some false teacher. He is the real deal. This is not a teaching, just an ordinary teaching that comes from men. This is from Jesus. This is from God himself. And I also got on here, since chapter this, uh, this section is titled Departing from the True Gospel and to Paul's, Paul's Defense, Paul is defending himself in this sense um, to confront, because there were accusations made against Paul that he wasn't the real deal. I mean, you got these false teachers trying to come in and mess everything up, what he's doing. So uh, that's, that's a pretty big deal when someone says that this teaching that I'm teaching you, eh, it's not from men, it's not from your ordinary Joe. It's from God. This is from Jesus Christ. And you need to listen. You need to understand that this is very important. Um, does anything, anyone else got anything on that? If not, I like that phrase, that he's the real deal. He's the real like deal. That. That's right. He's the real deal. And we'll learn more about him as we continue in this study tonight. Um, question number two. Paul makes certain to also mention... The fact that God raised Jesus from the dead, and that's in verse 1. Why does this truth matter so much? If Jesus is still dead, according to the scriptures, what does this mean? And uh, I have on there 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 19, which gives the answer to that, uh, which I can read. Uh, I'm turned to it right now. If anyone else would like to read it, that's fine. I'll go ahead and read it. If not, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 to 19. Um, if Jesus is still dead, what does this mean? Okay. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19 says this. Yes. Well... Actually, verse 12. Yeah, verse 12 and 19. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. That's a big deal there. Mommy. Um, Mommy. I have one here that pretty much exactly what he said. I just took it into sections. If Jesus is still Mommy. dead, if Jesus Mommy. died on that cross and he is still in the tomb, which he's not, but if he was, 
This would mean that all of us here right now are still in our sins. Our sins are not, have not been taken care of. Our sins are not wiped, wiped away. Our slate is not clean. If that were the case, which it's not. This would also mean that the apostles are found to be liars. This book right here, this whole New Testament, get rid of it. If it's false, which it's not. <laughs> of course it's not. This is rhetorical. If Christ is not raised, this, there would be some big consequences to this. And number three, the apostles have been preaching for nothing. I mean, and you have to understand this. When, when you talk to an atheist, when you talk to someone who does not believe in God, when you talk to someone who does not want anything to do with Christianity, uh, they may bring up the issue of the resurrection, which there is much historical evidence. I plan to do a sermon on that eventually sometime. Of the resurrection of Jesus outside of the Bible. When you talk to someone who doesn't believe in God, who doesn't believe in Christianity, or someone who's looking for God, believes there's a God, but doesn't know who is who, um, the resurrection of Jesus is one of the most important things that you can show a person. Because this is historically proven. Historically proven. You don't hear about it. This is just, there's historical evidence outside of the scriptures. But that is one thing you want to show them, and I'll provide material on that in the future. But the resurrection of Jesus is one thing you should always bring up to the, uh, the unbeliever. Um, That's the neat thing about Christianity. It's the only, quote-unquote, religion mm -hmm. that has a living Lord. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because... All the others are there. Exactly, yeah, and I believe... In one of the Gospels, Jesus was questioned, and uh, I forget the exact question, but Jesus says, Is God not the God of the living? Talking about Abraham uh, and those who have passed before. He said, God is the God of the living. He's not the God of the dead, inferring that Abraham was still living on, and stuff, um, etc. Do you think maybe um, Paul uh, wrote that there also? Because, I mean, when he was Saul, he didn't believe. And he mm -hmm. was persecuting the people that did believe mm -hmm. that. Uh, God raised mm -hmm. Jesus. So he's putting in there, hey guys, I know. <laughs> you know, like, hey, let me just start this out by saying, I know, and right. I believe it, and it's all good, it's right yeah. here in the front, you yeah. know. And then he goes on. I, I feel like he's still trying to um, justify himself a little bit mm -hmm. that he is really a Christian yeah. now. Uh, I mean, the story obviously went through uh, places and stuff that he had the scales and all mm -hmm. that happened to him, but I yeah. think he's feeling like he still has to prove to mm -hmm. man. He already knows he's with God. He knows he's with Jesus. And he knows mm -hmm. he knows he's good there. Now he has to prove himself to yeah. man right. that he's on yeah. the real deal. Yeah. He's a real deal. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, because he, he really, I mean, he was the perfect person for God to choose. Obviously, it was in his plan, but as, as um, how do I want to say, as, um, Saul, when he was Saul, not Paul, mm -hmm. he went after it with a zeal of life, what he believed in. Mm -hmm. So he was a perfect person to go after the zeal of life of mm -hmm. what you know God's word was. Mm -hmm. So I feel like he's still trying to, and I've known, I've thought that in different things when he's wrote to different churches, I have that has come to my mind before that he's reminding them that hey, I'm still. I'm, I'm with you. I, yeah. I got it. I want to yeah. remind you that I know yeah. I was this person. Yeah. I'm not trying to hide that I'm, I'm with you. I think yeah. if it's not for them, it's for himself mm -hmm. to say yeah. that he's still. Yeah. Yeah. I could, and there are a lot of false teachers back in his day. People were really trying to mess this up. People were really trying to plant. Uh, they had they had deceitful motives. If you read in other letters, um, the apostles even talk about some of those motives. But yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Paul had a lot going on for him at this time. And plus, Paul was a terrorist. He started as a terrorist. He was an ISIS member, in a sense. I mean, he was uh, trying to kill Christians. I mean, he, he, like you said, he believed in what he believed. He, and uh, eventually, just like Susie said, he saw the light. <laughs> he saw the light. Literally, he saw Jesus. Uh, and then I have one here that your faith is worthless. If Jesus was still dead, your faith would be worthless. And uh, it's important to know, too, that um, he also says that Christians who had previously died, who had fallen asleep, fallen asleep is a term for Christians, because you fall asleep, that it wouldn't mean anything for them. So your, your family members and your brothers and sisters who, you know, believe the gospel, accepted uh, the grace of God, that 
if this were not true, then, well, they'd still be in their sins too. There'd be no hope, absolutely no hope. So the resurrection is crucial, vital to the Christian faith, vital. Uh, if it If it were to have never happened, well, we'd all just be hanging out today, reading the book. That's all we'd be doing because none of this... This would be false testimony. This would be false. Um, that's right, exactly. And there's a, there's a Christian apologist. He, I listen to him all the time. His name's Frank Turk. If you ever get a chance, to look this guy up. Um, a Christian apologist, if you're not familiar with the term, he's it's someone who goes to colleges, talks with people, not just goes to colleges, but they defend the Christian faith by historical evidence. They debate evolution, scientists who don't believe in God, sorts. And he made the point that... The disciples, the apostles who wrote, you know, Paul, who wrote this letter, and the disciples who spread the gospel, they had nothing good in it for them during their day. This would get them killed. I mean, to, to, to write something like this would get them killed. It, they, this, there's no benefit. Hey, I'm going to write this so I can get killed. With who? You know, maybe I'll be famous. To go through Roman torture, Roman crucifixion. People just don't make this stuff up, especially back in their day. Back in their day, you you teach something like this, you're gonna get you're gonna get yourself killed. Uh, so I just think that's interesting. If you when you read the Bible, when you read the New Testament, um, just remember the culture that they lived in at that time and the persecution that was going against them. I mean, all you gotta say is, okay, none of this is true. I, I quit. You got your life, pretty much. You may be punished, but you keep your life more than likely. Um, but yeah. Keeping that in mind, that uh, Christians, if Jesus would have still been dead, those who have previously died would, would have perished. They have no hope for them. Number three, according to the Apostle Paul, getting the gospel right, I have that in bold, is serious business. Serious business. In verses six to nine, what does Paul say concerning anyone who preaches the gospel? Anyone who preaches, well, a false gospel, not the gospel. Anyone who preaches a false gospel, do you remember what the Apostle Paul says concerning that person? They are cursed. And he even goes as far as says, an angel, even if an angel, it doesn't have to just be us people. If an angel preaches a different gospel that other than what I have preached, let him be accursed because that gospel does not come from God. The one that he is preaching comes from the Lord. And, uh... Keep in context, too, that the gospel that he's preaching and defending is a gospel against teachings that require works for salvation. There's a broader context here, and Paul is attacking in love, but he's attacking. He's not messing around. This is, this is, this is serious stuff, and this is vital to the, the group that he's been working with. And uh, Verse 6, he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ, to a different gospel. He was astonished. He was blown away. You know about this grace of Christ, but yet you want to turn back to law? You want to turn back to being a slave under a ritualistic system of rules and regulations to get right with God? And uh, as we continue through this study, you'll see that even if a person wanted to get right with God by the law, they couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. Uh, but anyways, that's those are sermons in and of themselves. That's more thunder. I don't. <laughs> that's a lot in and of itself. Uh, so, yeah, if anyone preaches a different gospel, a false gospel, they're to be accursed, even an angel from heaven. This is serious, serious business. Number four, Paul says that if he were still seeking the approval of men, he would not be a servant of Christ, and that's in verse ten. What are some ways we can help each other in this area of seeking Jesus' approval rather than our neighbor's, neighbor's approval? Do you ever tend to do that sometimes? I don't worry about my neighbors. <laughs> well, well, I was raised in the church and I've been in the church and they can't say very much that mm -hmm. would convince me anything different. Well, it's a story about me. I, I was raised in the church, but I didn't live like the church. About me, 14 years old, I was drinking nonstop al alcohol. Um, I was, I lived in the world as a kid. I, I was locked up for seven and a half months as a kid, 14 years old. I was on probation for about three years. Uh, a lot of people, when they meet me, they don't, they don't think that. Like, there's one person who asked me, uh, 
No, uh, family, uh, like growing up, um, I, I lived a very worldly life. I never got into you know deep drugs or anything like that, but I lived a very ungodly life, very. And uh, so, uh, well, I, I made the mistake at one night at a party. They were some of the people were drinking, and I, of course, always had a coke or something. You know? <laughs> And I made a statement that I had never tasted alcohol. Mm -hmm. I, must, I think I was about 21 or 22, I'm not sure. Yeah, right. I was fairly young. And so later in the evening, somebody, that, well, she used to be my sister-in-law, but she gave me a glass of punch. Well, it wasn't punch. <laughs> yeah. And I took a drink of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, you couldn't tell the difference. I said... Yeah, yeah, I think I could. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. we didn't have any more discussion on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it was just sickening to me. Oh yeah. Yeah, I you know as a kid, uh um I I, I used to see it ar around my dad and um it was, you know, it was just something I grabbed onto as a kid and it was it was pretty bad. It was it was really I was really becoming addicted. I had to have it at 14. 14 years old, I had to have it. Now, I made that choice. No one made that choice for me. I made the choice to do what I did. But I bring that up. I mention that because um, to tie it in with the question, um, seeking Jesus' approval rather than others' approval, you know, when I became a Christian, uh, people laughed. People, guys I used to hang out with, they, they laughed at me. They thought I was crazy. They thought it was so funny. And uh, I was on fire for the Lord. I was on fire. Good. It was the transformation, and it's all of God, all of grace, none of me. But the transformation that a God can do, I, I'm, <laughs> I'll tell you, I've experienced it personally. I can only speak from personal experience. That, uh, tell you what, ever since then, ever, well, that was 14, but I, I became a Christian at age 18. And uh, I had plans to let, I planned to move to Washington with a guy I hung out with, and we were going we were just gonna live an ungodly life. That's you know God had other plans though, and it's uh, you know it's just amazing what God can do. But since I come from that past, since I come from that background, you know it, it was a big temptation for me starting out to seek the approval of people, especially my old friends I used to hang out with, rather than continuing in the approval of Christ. And, uh, but, I mean. I think you were saying this. I think the way we can help each other is just by being, I know you don't, I know what you're saying, not approval of other people, but as a Christian, like you were kind of saying, I can't go out and start cussing. Right, yeah. Flipping people off. Exactly, and just yeah. And say I'm a Christian. Uh, because I'm not given any kind of uh, uh, example to. They're not going to know you're a Christian by doing right, that, yeah. And I think that's what happens to Christians out there now that these people, you know, who are not really, I won't say full Christians, or whatever, but Christians who, uh, they just, they're giving us a bad name. Exactly, <laughs> I mean, yeah, they are. There's, yeah. there's things, I mean, there's things that I don't believe in um, that, you know, are in the Bible and stuff, but I'm also not going to go out there and tell people at an abortion clinic, we're going to blow it up. I mean, you know, we have, you've got to love, you, there's another way to go about doing these there's, things. Yeah, there's a lot. And I think that's where we run into problems. So not to, you said how we can help is like if I'm professing that I love Jesus and that I uh, want to, you know, I'm following Jesus, where I have to show that example to everybody. Amen. My kids. Completely, yeah. Your kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, I, you know, I also grew up in the church and I've been lucky, I've said this many times, mom made me live in a cave. <laughs> when I was little. So yeah. I didn't see anything until I went to college, and all of a sudden I was like, Whoa. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but yeah. I was able to, uh, I had that confidence, yeah. because I lived in that case, right. that, <laughs> that yeah. I had yeah. great role models, and my yeah. mom and my aunts, and, you know, and stuff as mm -hmm. growing up, yeah. that I knew, you know, that oh, yeah. he could be cool and be a grown up and, you know, love God and all that. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but I think that's how we ha can really help each other is by that and by our, just our actions. Mm -hmm. uh, completely agree. That was really good. Yeah, completely. Um, I do think, especially where you work at, too, uh, like if you work in a factory. I worked at f a factory before. And 
Man, I mean, you, people cuss all the time and act ungodly anywhere you go. But I tell you, you get you get some sweaty men in a <laughs> factory, 90 degree, 100 degree weather. I used to work with a, I think it was like a 1300 degree furnace. Ooh, you, you, uh, <laughs> there's some words that fly off the wall that you <laughs> you'd want to clean that wall afterward. And it, uh, but you know, and Christians are they're tempted to just kind of go along with it, not. To, their their light gets dim. Jesus says, "You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And sometimes it's easy to, you know, you don't want that conflict. You want to be accepted by everybody. You wanna you you want everyone to be friends. Well, I do too. But if I look at the Apostle Paul, was he accepted by everybody? No. Was Jesus accepted by everybody? Absolutely not. No. So well, that's. I don't think I've been accepted about them. I didn't care. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey. You. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, you know, uh, it's people, there's always been something about the gospel that people don't like. Uh, and we'll get to that. I kind of hit that next question. Uh, next question coming up. Yeah, next question. Um, but to stick on this question, question four. I added, um, being together for support, meeting regular, regularly, uh, as much as we can right now with COVID and all that. We've got to be careful about that. Uh, uh, and reminding each other just about what Jesus went through, about what Paul went through, about just who we are, um, ways to help each other, you know, throughout the week, because we're not around each other all week, you know, so we're, we're by ourselves sometimes with people who might not be Christians at all and who do things that aren't Christian-like, and um, it's easy to kind of get shifted away with them in their ways, and um, so just being there to support each other, whether that's through a phone call or Zoom or Skype or whatever, or uh, meeting with each other, um, and just, you know. Well, I, I found out a few different times in my life. I, I have been a teacher for several years, and I used to substitute teach all the time, and I didn't realize why I was called, but I was always called a substitute teach, and this is in Columbus, Indiana. Yep. And one night I went to a, a party or something and this assistant principal that always called me when he needed a substitute teacher and I often had a class that was wilder than reindeer. Reindeer. <laughs> and I was I sat on him very hard. And he told me one night at this I think it was a Christmas party, but we I went to this party and he said, I liked calling you because he said, I didn't even have to walk past your classroom door. He said, it was always quiet. And I said, because I scared him. <laughs> <laughs> Which really wasn't true. I think we laughed as much as we oh, yeah. shared. Yeah. But I, th I think they learned very well because we, we enjoyed each other. Yeah. I yeah. loved what I was doing yeah. and I think yeah. they knew it. Yeah. So, but I always thought I was fortunate. This was in Columbus, Indiana. Yeah. And they called me to sub-teach all the time. Mm. And once I started it, <laughs> I kind of sometimes wanted a day off. <laughs> yeah. But it was most enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for giving me the talent to be able to do that. Yeah. But yeah. I, the, thing, the reason I was called so much, I started out trying to major in math, and then I decided I'd ma minor in math, and I said, oh, I'll just take some math classes. <laughs> Forget this going yeah. all the way to the top on that one. Yeah. But anyhow, so since I could teach math, I was often called, and I was hey. teaching geometry and trigonometry and all oh, that wow. in Columbus. Yeah, a lot but mm. anyhow. You taught the vice president all he knows, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I had vice president Pence, yep. and he came up to me one time at a meeting in Indianapolis, and he said, you're so familiar to me. And I said, yeah, but you didn't have white hair the last time I saw you. I had him in eighth grade. He's got some. He's got snow white hair. I tell you. He sure do. I, I think my TV screen's bright. Woo, when he gets on the screen. <laughs> but he's a wonderful Christian man. Oh, yeah. I, I, I really very much respect him. I really do. I really enjoy him. I hear it. I, do I hear the guy talk? <laughs> I do. Um. Well, see, I taught him some of that. That's right. He's he's where he's at because of you. <laughs> oh, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but I, I think he still speaks to me anytime he sees me. Yeah, that's great, too. 
Oh, all right. Question. My grandson worked with them too. So oh, did he? We carried it on. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Two. Yep. Question number five. How did Paul receive his gospel? We kind of went over that already. He received it from Jesus, a revelation of Jesus Christ, not your ordinary Joe, uh, not your ordinary person. He received it from God himself. Um, why do you think many people today deny this gospel? That's a big question. Why do you think that many people in today's culture deny the gospel? I don't know if I like that word deny. Or reject. But or I, I think that sometimes suppress. we, well, suppress it probably. To pray. I hope that by the way I live, people know I'm a Christian, mm -hmm. but I didn't go out and proclaim it all over everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I think that they've been around me enough to know that I'm not, not there speaking in bad language. Yeah. Well, Susie, what did you start to say about me? <laughs> <laughs> but because I was raised here in this church and I've yeah. been here for several years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I it is it is interesting when you go to a job and you you're walking with Christ and you're acting like Christ wants you to the big difference that you make in that building the big difference even if I'll, I'll go to work and uh you know I don't tell people don't cuss in front of me I I don't tell, I don't dictate people but they just like oh okay I'm sorry if customer flies out of their mouth it's like I'm so sorry I'm thinking well you ain't gotta be sorry to me you need to be sorry <laughs> sorry Lord not me. But uh, but you do stand out in that sense. And uh, coming from somebody who was a part of the world as a kid, I know that people look at the church as some some um, hypocritical organization that uh, you just come in, do certain things on Sunday, and then you go home and you act differently. Unfortunately, that's what some Christians have made it. Um, and they are very wrong to paint with such a broad brush. Uh, first of all, that's not that's not what the church is. Uh, we're imperfect people, amen. But you know, we're saved and forgiven and loved, and that's exactly that's right. And we're working progress. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why, well, there's many reasons why people deny the gospels. Um, specifically in Romans one, I believe it's verse eighteen. Or so Paul says, uh, concerning the context he's speaking of, that there were people who suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. They didn't, they, they didn't want anything of it. Rather than worshiping God, they worshiped nature. They worshiped the things that he created rather than him. What's happening today? People worship things. They have idols. Um, they want to live their life how they want to live. But I think they deny the gospel. Um, also because they... When I watched Frank Turk talk to a college student, he asked him, he said, if I told you, if, if you found out the gospel were true, were true would, you, you know, would you accept it? And he said no. So, many people I think, not saying everybody, but many people I think have, they already have the decision made up in their heart. That it's like they want to pick an argument. Not everybody, but for someone to say that if you were presented with something that were true, and they couldn't deny it, but they still rejected it. Then it sounds like they don't want to, you know, submit their life to God. Doesn't they, you know they don't want to do what God wants them to do? That could be a reason they deny the gospel. It's an uncomfortable feeling. Absolutely, especially with what comes with being a disciple too. Um, I know firsthand of that. Excuse me. You know, I lost, lost. I gained Christ. I didn't lose anything. Uh, but people I used to hang out with thought they were my friend. There's a couple, a few I still hear from. Great guys. Great guys. They're, they're okay with everything. Uh, with what I believe, how I live. And, but most, if not everyone, like there's one guy I grew up with, he just, you know, he just don't want nothing to do with it. And then, you know, the chips fall where they lie with you. Uh, but, you know, I have to go by what I believe is true. And uh, But accepting the gospel... With that comes rejection from others. You're not going to be so eagerly accepted. Hey, you want to come party? You want to come go do this, go do that, that you know God would not approve of. And you know in your heart that he don't want you to do. And you say no. Well, people aren't going to like that. Oh, what about the old you? Come on.
you've got to think about that a little bit. Because I kind of went through a series like that, but I found out later, maybe 10 years later, after I kind of left public mm -hmm. working and everything, that I think people respected me mm -hmm. more. Yeah. Because they knew. And I, I knew sometimes when I would like go into the Coke room or something, you know, they'd say, oh, here, here she is, you know. Right. Because they didn't want to be saying these nasty things while I'm walking through. Yeah. But you made a difference. Just so, by living for Christ, you made a difference. Your, your light shined in that room. It didn't embarrass me or anything at yeah. all. Yeah, right. But it was just one of these things where people would say, shh. I've, is, yeah, I know of I know of some Christians who have, one Christian who passed away, and he was, he was he was an older guy, and he was just he, he you could tell he loved Christ, he he did he loved Jesus, but he was scared to share his faith with people. He was he, it's just a normal a human nature. You just want to be accepted by people. I'm not saying he wanted to be accepted. He was just scared to vocalize his faith because well you, you know don't want to offend exactly, and you don't yeah yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, uh, yeah. People can. It's okay for them to tell us about every little thing that they've ever done, yeah. yes. or believe, or whatever. But you know, yeah. I and I have to listen to it, uh, or I mean, you don't have, but you know what I mean. No, I know it's yeah, it. yeah. Uh, like you know, I and Susie knows this person I'm talking about, but she is allowing her twelve-year-old um, daughter to become a boy, and mm -hmm. I just think that's too young. I mean, that's just way too young in my mind. I don't like it anyways, but... Right, I know what you're like, saying. Adolescence, is this really what this oh, child wants? Is it a bad thing? Is it a, you know, whatever? And they're taking her down and giving her the testosterone shots and all this stuff. And I have to hear that. But then if I make my... She said, you know, she'll ask me, what do you think? And if I make my point... Right. I think it's too young. It's not my child or whatever, but I think it's too young. And that's bad on me. I'm judging. Well, don't ask me. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to know the answer, but, don't ask. Yeah, but I mean, uh, when we're out there now, like you said, it's wonderful because I don't remember ever telling this family I worked with that I was a Christian. I just went in and did you know, my job with them and stuff. And uh, I asked a prayer for the mom. She has brain cancer. And she called me uh, Monday, well, actually Sunday evening. And uh, asked me to ask for prayer because um, they, she got sick again and they found two more spots on her brain. But she's like, I know you and your sister pray. I don't, yep. Elena was her case manager yep. at one time too. And I, I asked Elena, and I, we don't think either one of us ever mentioned yeah. Yeah. anything about that. But she's yeah. like, I know you guys pray. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it's just, it's just a catch-22 sometimes. But I think when you ask, like, why do you, uh, you think people today deny the gospel? I'm not even sure that they really deny the gospel. I'm not sure they understand it or know it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not. Yeah. Tr uh, it's not treated like you know. Nowadays, the all the church services or whatever that you used to see on Channel Six, Timothy the Church Mouse, you know, and all the you used to be able to watch them. Mm -hmm. Now they're not even on. You have to like get a certain cable channel. Yeah. To find these, I mean, you've got to, I mean, where they were on there, um, ABC, mm -hmm. CBS, and then yeah. they used to play it all the time. Yeah. Um, or, you know, or um, whatever, at Easter, there's always a special, or Christmas. And now, everything, even on TV, just regular, everyday TV shows have just, they can, you know, pull people off, they Filth, can test, yeah. they can, you know, all yeah. this stuff, and you can't enjoy, I mean, you you're thinking, oh, this is a pretty decent movie or something, and then, you know, yes. for whatever reason, they yeah. have to throw three cuss words in there just because, you know. Yeah. And I, yeah. just, I just wonder if... Um, They're not even going to allow Charlie Brown on yeah. TV. You know, actually, I saw today that they reversed that. Oh, no, really? I saw an article today. I'm right sorry. before I came here, I was as shocked as everybody else is. I was so happy. It said that the title was Charlie Brown this year won't... After all, we'll be running on television this year. Wow. So I'm hoping they stick with it. I, right. I really am. But I just, I just think that... Um, That'd be wonderful. I just don't know if people know it. The kids mm -hmm. know it. Because this, for my yeah. age group of people, we dropped the ball. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm just, I mean, you know, we dropped the ball right there on this age group. We just didn't, you know, we didn't give them even the chance or the choice mm -hmm. to... Uh, 
decide whether they want to deny it or not. I mean, they didn't get the choice. They, I, I know a lot of people uh, that I went to that went to church when they were little with me and stuff who don't go to church and to take their kids to church. I just feel like my generation um, has just dropped the ball. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned you mentioned that one of your friends, is one of your friends asked you to pray for her. When I hear that, when someone comes up to me and says, will you pray for me? I'll say, yeah, but, you know, how much I want them to understand that you can pray too. You can go before God just like I can. Uh, the gospel, forgiveness, and grace is extended to you just as much as it's extended to me. Yeah, but they have confidence. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah, the, yeah, I, absolutely, I don't want, yeah, but I want them to understand that regardless of what state they're in in their life, position they're in in their life, no matter where they're at, no matter how many sins, no matter how many wrongs you've done, doesn't matter if it's killing someone, the worst thing you could possibly think of, God will forgive you, period. He will, it's possible. Uh, there's no question about it. A lot of times they feel comforted. Absolutely. As a Christian, yeah. if you offer to pray with yep. them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because the they, or something. Like they got a, yeah, a, a security, a backup in a way, yeah. I think another thing to know is like when Mommy. April was saying that, you know, Mommy. people like knew that she prayed oh. and, you know, people like would know that when you were going into like. Oh, okay. Prayer, <laughs> Just making sure. Like, I think you said the code room or something that people. Would not, you know, talk about like, you know, wouldn't have bad conversations. Mommy. It just shows that, you know, like, you know, Christians can be like so, like, um, you know, transformed because you know it tells us, you know, Scripture to not be conformed by the world, but to be transformed, you mm -hmm. know, like by the renewing of our minds, you know, in Jesus Christ, and and so just like when we're not conforming, I think that really is a, a time when Christians really stand out. You know, yeah. We're just, you know, I think it's amazing a lot of times when someone will yeah. or say to Stumble me, mm -hmm. I, are you going through a rough time with something because you're not yourself? Right. And you're not thinking that you're not yourself. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, well, I've been thinking about something as <laughs> a family member that's been very ill in the hospital or something, you know. Mm -hmm. But at least they, they know it and, and tell me they'll pray for them or right. something sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Something so small can be so uplifting to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was, that was good thoughts on that question too. All right, last question. Questions. Question six. What kind of back? And this is kind of. There's actually three questions here, and you can answer it however you want. What kind of background does Paul come from? Has he always been a friend of Jesus? At what and at what specific time did God choose for Paul to be an apostle, and to what group of people was he sent to preach the gospel? That's all. <laughs> That's four questions right there. So, <laughs> uh, he has a background of kind of what you're saying, laws. Yeah. The Jewish tradition yeah. at that time had gotten to be just that tradition. It wasn't necessarily. Um, that's why I think they couldn't accept Jesus because they were so used to we gotta do it this way, we gotta yep. do it this way, we gotta do it this yep. way, we gotta do it this way. And Jesus is all coming in and saying, Yeah, no, we're gonna be cool. Yeah. You know, if we're gonna love everybody, it's gonna be, you know, chill. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, I'm sure Jesus didn't say chill, but you know, um, <laughs> he came in with this whole different mm -hmm. attitude. And yeah. that was something a lot of them couldn't mm -hmm. uh, couldn't change. So he came from a uh, background a he came from a religion, not like a relationship. A relationship. Yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing that Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. One of the people who, I mean, really ch tried to challenge Jesus. He was one of those guys. I'm not saying he challenged Jesus, but he was a part of that group, the Pharisees. And uh, Pharisees, they were, they were sincere, but they added, they added additional boundaries to, um, the Mosaic Law, kind of like what people do today. They add additional boundaries, they add additional, you know, Jesus says, it is clear, no one ever would argue that Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Love your neighbor. No one would ever argue that. But it's when people want to add additional requirements that you don't find in the scriptures, like mu prohibit, prohibiting the use of musical instruments, or whatever. I mean, you can come up with anything. And they want to hold that over your head 
And then what to say, if you don't submit to this, you're, not, you're either not saved, you're, you're going to be excommunicated from our church, and the list goes on and on. Uh, but Paul was a Pharisee. He was very genuine in what he did. He was zealous, he said, more than his ancestors were. And he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And this tribe, um, I've done a little research on it. This is a tribe that was held highly. I mean, he, they, Paul was a serious, a serious Jew. He was a serious guy. Um, and again, he was zealous for the law. And I got on here. Uh, of course, as we all know, he was a terrorist. He persecuted the church. He was the guy who held the cloak when uh, S- Stephen was getting stoned. He was that guy. Here, give me his cloak. I'll hold it. He was that guy. And he was, I can't imagine seeing someone stoned. But uh, but then, before you knew it, uh, he came to the faith. And it was hard for these people in Galatia. Uh, he, he was saying that, you know, the people. Know he came to the faith. He was driven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, really. I mean, he ran ahead of him. <laughs> I mean, going. He had to smack him upside down. Yeah. <laughs> he had his attention. Really. Well, I can. I can. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was it was some serious stuff. He was he is your modern he was your modern day ISIS member, and you know I had heard whether this is true or not I don't know, but many ISIS members were converting to Christianity uh, because they they said and I don't know that uh, they had dreams of Christ of Jesus uh, in their I don't know. Like, I've but, heard a lot of reports of how the Lord is revealing Himself mm-hmm. through dreams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's praise God. Yes. Whatever the reason is <laughs> that they come to Him, praise God. Uh, but yeah, Paul in verse I think twenty three, chapter one. But they were hearing only He who formerly persecuted us now preaches a faith which He once tried to destroy. Imagine the head leader of ISIS. Well, he's dead now. But imagine if one, if he was still living and he came in this building. Imagine if he walked up in here. Okay, <laughs> it's going to be very uneasy, <laughs> uh, and I, I, I'm, I would probably, my gut instinct would be like, get out. I, no, we don't, no, we, you're here to harm us. And if he said, you know, I proclaim Jesus, you know, I believe the gospel, how would we react to that? Uh, that's that's exactly the same situation or similar to the situation that the people back in the day uh, who lived with Paul went through. Um, this is a man who was known for persecuting the church. Um, so Paul was a Pharisee. He was circumcised on the eighth day, as every Jew is, a uh, Jewish man. And from the tribe of Benjamin, he called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews um, and a former persecutor of the church. And that uh, he actually gives that description in Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 to 8. And... Uh, the last, I think it's the last question. Yeah, at what specific time did God choose for Paul to be an, a disciple, uh, an apostle? Paul, he, he gives a specific time. Uh, you guys remember what he said? Verse, well, let me see if I can find it. Verse 15, he says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace... So from his mother's womb, God already had this in mind. He specifically set Paul aside for a specific purpose to be an apostle to preach to Gentile believers. Um, Made me think today, we all have a purpose. Every single one of us here have a purpose. Um, And all of us have spiritual gifts. Every single believer has a spiritual gift. And uh, I eventually want to talk on that in the future. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 specifically gives them a list of gifts that Christians can have. And, uh, and it's not, uh, you know, being a pastor, being a, uh, uh, that's not the only one, or, you know, uh, televangelist or whatever you want. You know, simply teaching, forgiving, showing mercy. Um, these are called spiritual gifts uh, and little things like that. Maybe you're good at serving. Maybe you're good at just calling someone up, seeing how they're doing. Um, God all has a purpose for us just as much as he had a purpose for the Apostle Paul. I don't, he may not be calling you to you know, do what the Apostle Paul did, but uh, he knows that you're good at something, and he's giving you the ability to do it. And all of us have to make that up for our, our, 
our own mind of what we believe is our spiritual gifts that God's given us. Um, so that that concludes <laughs> um, session one. Good. I'm glad. I hope that uh, it's my prayer that we just all of us walk away understanding that uh, uh, that God he he truly does love us, and to really understand how we're saved, how we stay right with Him. And just what the Apostle Paul, we learn about the Apostle Paul too in this, a lot about him. Um, and how this is so related to today. It may not be the Mosaic Law, but from my background, and uh, I see similar teachings like this creeping in in the Gospel. And uh, that's why I felt it was necessary to not attack this book, but jump all over it. Um, so remember everybody in, who was mentioned today, um, you, Janet, you said, who who was it that uh, she's in? She's not in ICU. Oh, Chris's mother. Okay. 